A word of warning. This podcast explores graphic and disturbing stories and includes some strong language. It therefore may not be suitable for our young listeners or other folks who may find it disturbing. Hello and welcome to True Crime Daily, the podcast covering high profile and under the radar cases from across the country every week. I'm your host, Anna Garcia. Our cases this week are rooted in revenge and some of the victims are just children. I can hear my niece screaming in the next room, just screaming and screaming and screaming. That's just one of the survivors addressing a man who's just been sentenced to 375 years in prison for the brutal stabbing of two children and the execution-style shooting of a college student in New Jersey. The family was reportedly tied up and tortured for hours, all because he didn't like their Facebook post about him. And we're also covering a murderous plot hatched by three sisters in Oklahoma, all to kill the father of one of their children because of a custody dispute. It's a case of sisters helping sisters. They lured and ambushed the man to a church parking lot, and they almost succeeded in killing him, but he survived the shooting, and now the three sisters are behind bars, and they are the ones with the custody problem. Okay, we are recording this on Wednesday, April 13th. 2022. Our guest today is Philip Hamilton. Philip, welcome back. We're so excited to have you. We know you're super busy. You've been in and out of court today. Um, So thanks for making the time. Absolutely, Anna. Thanks for having me. Uh, We've got some uh, very disturbing stories today. And we've also got a case that is just plain crazy. Three women who I think had way too much time on their hands and thought that uh, they could execute (laughs) a, a, a murder plot. Uh, I think they were watching way too much TV. And no pun intended there in regards to the execute, because on both ends, total failure. And oh. and and very much so happy that it did turn out that way for that unfortunate father. But I'm sure we'll discuss about more oh, about it, that. It, it's just really it's it's craziness. So um, here's here are the basics and then we'll kind of go through what was going on. So it was a custody battle. Really, that's what was going on. And um, it ends in this crazy murder plot, which thank God was not successful. And the mother who was in the dispute with her ex over their child decides to have her sisters help her fix this custody problem by getting rid of the father. You get rid of the father, you get rid of the problem? I don't think so, Philip. <laughs> These are decisions you have to make before you decide to have children, not at the end of the breakup, wherein now you're just trying to take this person off the face of the earth. Not a good decision at all. You and I always talk about good decision making versus bad decision making. Every time I'm with you, Anna, this is terrible decision making. Horrible. And, And to think it's one thing when one person comes up with a crazy idea, right? And they keep it and they do it because usually most people do things on their own or maybe they hire someone. But this woman actually got two of her sisters to buy into it. That's the part that I find equally insane. Like at what point didn't one of them say, hey, maybe we shouldn't do this? No, they were all in according to the FBI. And not only were they all in, they were all in in a very inefficient, ineffective, and and just flat out embarrassing way. I mean, not to take anything away from, again, what could have happened in this situation, um, but fortunately the father survived. But in terms of just, you want to talk about just dumb planning and just (laughs) pathetic execution in in regards to what they were trying to do, it's all tied in here. And I'm just, again, I'm glad that nothing worked out as the way that they wanted it to. Mm -hmm. The father survived the shooting and the three sisters in arms, as I call them, have been found guilty of all of their crimes as part of this attempted murder plot. So it's a little hard to follow because we've got three sisters and then we have uh, the father who is not named and other players. So I I will try and keep this as simple for everyone to follow along because there are just so many names here. Uh, Let's start at the beginning with the couple at the center, right? We're dealing with the sister who was in a relationship with this man who has the victim, who has remained unnamed, and therefore we will keep it that way. Tirzan Mapson, that's her name. She and the victim, you know, the baby daddy, they were in a relationship in the North Carolina area around 2012. A year later, a baby girl is born from this relationship. 
By 2014, this would be two years after they met, they are in family court in the middle of a custody battle. The mother, Tirza, was given primary custody and the father was given visitation. Now, by 2018, the girl would have been about five at this point. The right. parents have moved even you know, farther apart. And I'm not just talking emotionally, I'm talking physically. So you have the mother in Oklahoma and you have the father in Florida. So you can see where this is all going because when it's time for visitation, it's becoming a bit inconvenient, although that's not a reason to kill someone. That summer, the, su the summer that the plot is, um, you know, rolled out, if you will. So summer of 2018, um, Tirza and her sisters, Alyssa and Karis, hatch this plot to resolve this custody issue by getting rid of dad. The mother tells the father she wants to leave the child with him for two weeks at the end of the month. And he's like, great, I'd love to have my child. This is fantastic. So because they live far away from each other, they come up with um, a point. You know, parents do this a lot. I, you know, my child is the product of divorce. He's a grown man now, you know. You have places where you switch off. It isn't always a pickup drop off at home. Okay. All of this so far seems kind of normal. So it is um, Tirza and her sisters who come up with the location in Alabama. It's going to, it's like a remote area and it's a church parking lot. But I would think it's like, oh, we're meeting at a church. Okay. That sounds pretty safe. Like I, my, my radar wouldn't be up on this one. Would it be for you? No, you. I, I, funny that you said that. I wouldn't even be thinking, oh, this is safe. I wouldn't be thinking anything at all. This is just the point with which we are, you know, doing the drop off and, and, and that's it. I wouldn't have any reason to think of anything at this point anyway. Yeah. So June 17th, the plan is really coming together. The FBI says that Alyssa creates a notes document on her phone, which lists items that they're going to be needing. I always love these to do notes. <laughs> Disguises ladder, climbing rope, binoculars, luck beads, bless and luck necklaces, and gloves. I love that the sisters wanted good luck charms. Do you love that? I love that. And I also just love how type A people, no matter what scenario they're in, whether they're at work with their organizing or they're organizing an attempted murder plot, they always make sure that they have those notes ready to go. And of course, in these situations, they always turn out to be if not the most incriminating evidence, certainly up there, is still nevertheless, it's just crazy. They, they can't let it go. <laughs> not even in the attempted murder plot. They can't let it go. They got to write those notes. Apparently, their good luck charms did not work. No. <laughs> there was an epic fail there on, on the lucky charms. Well, you know what? It might have been inversely played for the father. Maybe it was his luck that day, right? Oh, I so like the way you think. Mm -hmm. the, the universe is always going to let it play out. So it was good luck for him. Ah, I love the way you think. Yes, yes, yes. I agree. I accept that. Absolutely. So there were also all these texts going back and forth, like more than 100 texts that the FBI was able to collect. And the plan is to lure the dad to this church in Alabama. This is going to be the handoff location. Now, here's whether they planned this or they knew this or they didn't. There was another victim in the car. So when he drives up, to Alabama to the spot. He has his new wife with him in the car. So what he didn't know is he's sitting in the church parking lot waiting and they were delayed. They were delayed because the mother kept sending texts. Oh, you know, I got, I'm, I'm stuck in traffic. The kid's puking. There are all these reasons why they were sitting there sitting ducks for hours, hours. So um, you've got the sisters kind of all over the place. You've got two sisters who drive to Alabama to prepare. The third sister is in Florida, not far from the father's home. It gets a little messy. I don't know why she was down there. I don't know if she was doing surveillance. Um, so finally at 10 PM that night, the mother texts the father to confirm the meeting spot for the handing off of the child, which is going to be, you know, the next day. So right. yes, everything is set to go now. All right. The sister who had been in Florida is now buying binoculars at Walmart. Now, you could make the argument she's a bird watcher. If you came to my house, I'd have a lot of binoculars. You could look at it two ways. Garcia is either, you know, crazy watching all the neighbors or she really is a bird watcher. <laughs> but when you put it... Not, not always mutually exclusive, but nevertheless, as the defense attorney, you have you have something, right? You, you, you're going in there with something. Now, if that's ultimately going to prevail, which it didn't. Um, you know, you deal with it then, but you have something that you're going in with. So, mm -hmm. all right. Okay. So 
now we're presumably getting set for the ambush. So the next morning, the FBI says that the sisters are sending each other all sorts of messages of encouragement, you know, kind of like, yeah, we can do this. Um, <laughs> um, one of them writes, th this was crazy. This is again on the morning. Um, one writes, this is just like the video game Halo. No, it is not, ladies. <laughs> This is real life, actually. Is, That's a. It's not <laughs> a virtual a killing. Different. No, no. Yeah, this is this is not a program. This is real life. This is a life. This is someone's life. This is the father of your child. But nevertheless, they needed to get a life. That these three, right? These three. Okay. So, um, what's also important to note here is that Karis, one of the sisters, has a background in military training. According to the FBI, she served in the Marine Corps from 2007 to 2011. This is a woman who knows how to shoot. Lots of women know how to shoot, though. But nonetheless, storing that in the back. So they also decide that they're going to camouflage the white pickup truck. This is how they disguise the pickup truck. They put black stripes on it. But they don't change the Oklahoma plates. Help me here, Philip. <laughs> so they made it a very conspicuous zebra-oriented vehicle with nevertheless the same plates that are tracking right back to where all this begins. Again, this 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 planning is uh, or planning, as we should say, it's mm -hmm. ridiculous. Absolutely ridiculous. At the very least, take the plates off, would you? <laughs> At the very least. OK, <laughs> so by the afternoon. So now it's about three in the afternoon. This is on the day of the ambush. At 3 p.m., the mother sends a text to the father who is already in the church parking lot waiting for his daughter, who's about five at this time. Um, the mom texts that. Um, Hey, I ran into, quote, I ran into traffic and we running a few hours late. Can you imagine this man has been sitting in this parking lot for hours? He's driven up from Florida to get his child, but he sits. You know, when I was just kind of getting versed on this story, that was the thing I think that stuck out to me the most. Um, you know, just being in a position where you're already traveling out of state, you're really looking forward to picking up your child. You're going to sit there and you're going to eat that in regards to like, look, if you're if you're a few hours late, like I love my child, I'm going to wait. But there is something there that just had to be flat out infuriating in like a few hours, not a few minutes, a few hours. And I can't say that at that point it would be a tell that something's up. But certainly I'm sure him and his wife in the truck were starting to have a discussion about what is going on. Right. Exactly. Exactly. Oh, and she had answers for everything. The mother. So around 5, 18 p.m., day of the ambush, the father is really getting impatient and he's been waiting for two hours at this point and he's texting the mother. So now the mother has a new excuse two hours later after the first one, which is about traffic. She says, quote, that their child got sick and puked in the car. Okay, if you're a dad, you know, it is possible Children who are five do throw up in cars. You know, it just it just is. Right. So he's still sitting there waiting. So about a half hour later, was which is about 5.40 p.m. on the timeline, um, someone fires into the parked car in which the father and his, and his wife are sitting. And the father is injured. The bullet goes through the trunk of the car and strikes him in the shoulder. According to the FBI, surveillance video shows him trying to get out of the car, obviously because he's being fired upon, gets down to the ground, and then apparently shots are being fired to the ground, trying to further injure this man as he's trying to get out of the car. Right. Finally, the father and his wife managed to get to a store nearby. All of this is supported by surveillance video. You know, and they call 911. The man is taken to the hospital. And what police start figuring out is that a white pickup truck was seen leaving the area right after the shooting. Hello. <laughs> and they also, you know, have figured out that it was a rifle. The area it was likely shot from, which was, you know, behind. So a few things are coming together and the police are like, this is a most unusual, right? A really unusual situation. So a few days after all of this, the FBI brings in the mother for questioning and she, according to the FBI, tells them, oh, her truck was stolen by a stalker. How mm. do you know that the person was a stalker? 
I mean, mm-hmm. most people would just say my truck was stolen. No, no, no. My truck was stolen by a stalker. I mean, they were just interested at that point in terms of what she was actually going to say. I think from the minute that the father was shot and then essentially crawling out of the car for safety, he already knew. He already knew. Like right then and there in terms of short of this being an accident, which maybe could have been the first shot. Once he realized that he was being targeted when those shots were coming, when he was still on the ground, he knew. And, you know, his wife knew, too. That's exactly why the feds had, you know, the mother of the child in there getting questioned a few days later. And they knew exactly, most likely, where they were going. They were just waiting for her to slip up. Here was the first slip up, just as you noted. How do you know it's a stalker? Exactly. That That's like so crazy. So it does take a while to get the federal indictment, but there is one. A year later, the three are indicted. And what's interesting is two of the sisters decided to take off. And they were in hiding in Northern California in Eureka at a campsite. So it took a (laughs) while to track them down, but the authorities did track them down. And according to the authorities, they resisted arrest. Are we surprised? We're not surprised. And I'm not surprised at the irony of after the just horrendous planning that took place with respect to this plot of all places there in a town called Eureka. (laughs) Right. I mean, Mm -hmm. this story ultimately had to end up on this podcast. So that is the town they needed to be in for us to be able to talk this all the way through. Mm hmm. Yep. So two of them get arrested there in California. The third sister gets picked up in Tulsa. So, um, Finally, we get to sentencing because there is justice in this. You know, again, all of this is over a custody issue. So these three are going to be in prison for a really long time. And the mother, when do you think she's ever going to see her child? And when she finally does see her child, what in the world are you going to say to your child when she knows you tried to kill her father? Like, what do you do with this? I mean, wherever you do say it, you're going to be saying it under the conditions of supervised visitation, Um, you know, to the extent that you wanted that relationship with your child, that you went all out with this ridiculous, you know, plotting to be able to try and have that full and sole custody. You know, not only did you blow that opportunity, but now just think about everything that you've done to your child, not just to your ex, who your child loves as their father. But just to your child. Now, you know, your child is without a mother. You have to tell all my friends, oh, my mom's in jail because she tried to kill my dad. With Within these custody disputes, when we think of just, you know, some of the most gruesome, heinous offenses that have ever taken place that particularly have been newsworthy, so often it's these custody disputes at the core, right? It's either kids, money, or both. And, you know, in these kinds of situations, this is where things can get volatile. And this is where things can get dangerous and you know it's really sad to just know that it came to this point really is oh it's awful so let's talk about sentencing um these three are going to be away for a while so um tirza mapson who's 29 Alyssa mapson who's 25 and karis who's 33 were sentenced to between five and ten years in prison for their attempt to kill the father of the child all three were convicted on the following counts conspiracy to commit interstate domestic violence, interstate stalking, uh, discharge of a firearm in furtherance of a violent crime, traveling in interstate commerce with the intent to stalk another person using the mail, any interactive computer devices. All this is extremely important. Remember, these are federal, federal charges. This was an FBI case. This was not a local case because you had them in multiple states. You had them in Oklahoma, in Florida, Alabama, traveling in between states, setting the man, luring him. So that's why these are all federal charges and not necessarily, you know, what you think of your typical in the attempted murder charge space. No, absolutely. I mean, that's ultimately how the feds always do get jurisdiction. Once you start crossing state lines, then some of what would otherwise be the run of the mill, you know, state level local offenses, they become federal offenses. And, you know, in this matter, the U.S. Attorney's Office had no issue in terms of building a very strong case using the resources of the federal government as opposed to some of the more you know stretched resources of local governments to prove this case up and i I think they did a great job frankly it's interesting that the authorities have never either identified determined figured out who exactly shot the rifle that to me 
you know, I know it's not the most interesting part of this, but it, it wasn't, apparently it wasn't necessary exactly. for the conviction here. They didn't it's need not. to identify the shooter. It's not, because once they got all of the girls on the conspiracy, then once you're involved in the conspiracy as a co-conspirator, you're responsible for the acts of every other co-conspirator that occurred throughout the course of that conspiracy. So most likely, if we all had to put our money on it, probably the shooter was the one that had the Marine training. But even to the extent that it wasn't, as far as the government's concerned, who cares? Once you all pled guilty to the conspiracy, you're all guilty of it. Sisters in arms. Philip, our next case is from New Jersey. A man has been sentenced to 375 years for killing two children and a woman all over a Facebook post that he didn't like. And, you and I, don't, know I don't know if that's enough time, honestly, with no. what we're about to discuss. I don't know if that's enough time. No, it's not enough time. It's not enough time. And you know what? At the end of the day, what she posted on Facebook was the truth. Okay. That, I mean, not that that should matter, but I'm just saying um, yeah. that's what we're talking about. He was mad about a Facebook post. You know that this is such a heinous crime when the judge calls the killer, quote, pure evil. It is among the most heinous crimes that you will ever hear of. Certainly one of the worst that the judge has ever had to deal with. In 2016, Jeremy Arrington stabbed two children to death and shot a college student execution style while she was begging for her life. He also tied up and tortured other members of the family. Jeremy had allegedly known this family for a long time. It's not like they were strangers. So what sent Jeremy into such a rage? As if there could be any answer or excuse. The mother of the, the two children who were killed had made a comment on Facebook that Jeremy was wanted by the police. He indeed was wanted by the police for a long criminal record. At the time of this attack, he was a suspect in a shooting and sexual assault case. This is what triggered the guy. The attack. Let's discuss this. On November 5th of 2016, Jeremy broke into the home of the Whitehurst family in Newark with a gun. He tied up nine people inside the apartment and he proceeded to torture them by stabbing them with kitchen knives. The torture reportedly lasted an hour and a half and the stabbings led to the death of two children, seven-year-old Ariel Whitehurst and her 11-year-old brother, Aljahan Whitehurst. I'm not even done. I'm not even done. The aunt of the children reportedly could hear Ariel's screams in the bathroom. She was stabbed over and over until the child stopped. That was the hardest part of reading for this story. That part right there. It's all hard. And it's all, um, I don't know, just, just unimaginable and unthinkable. But that was the hardest part for me, right? Like the screams until they stopped. Yeah, these are just babies. They're An eight-year-old, correct? Or was yeah. the... Seven and 11, yeah. Yeah, okay. Brother and sister, absolutely. I mean, there's you can't take any life. But, you know, this is this is just horrific. Yeah. Then Jeremy shot and killed Saisha McBurrows, um, who was a family friend. She was in college and she was visiting during the time of the attack. What horrible timing for this young woman. Police responded to, to the attack... After a call, get this, from a young girl with autism who escaped, was hiding in the closet and called 911. Despite all her challenges, this little girl managed to do what was needed. She called 911. God bless her. Literally. Um, she, yes. Literally. She was, she was blessed at that. She was. She really was. Jeremy Arrington was apprehended after a standoff with SWAT. He barricaded himself in the apartment building. The judge during the case, especially at sentencing, he described in detail how the two children were tortured. Here is a clip from ABC7. This is Essex County Superior Court Judge Ronald Wiggler. Little Ariel Whitehurst sustained over 15 stab One stab wound was inflicted with such force, the tip of the knife broke off in her skull. Little Al-Jahan sustained over 12 stab wounds. You plunged a knife so hard and so deep through this young boy's back that it exited through his chest. Now, when you hear the judge describing in detail 
how this man attacked those two children. I don't know how anybody had any restraint in that courtroom, frankly. And it was very emotional at sentencing. Yeah. You know, I was given that a lot of thought, right? Like there was a time in my career where I was a public defender, whereas now, you know, I'm in private practice. So I, you know, certainly have much more discretion over the cases that I can take and that I don't take. Um, this is certainly a case um, I would never take in private practice. I just wouldn't because I wouldn't be able to give this man his Sixth Amendment right to effective assistance of counsel because I would just be too emotionally told to represent him in the way in which the Constitution requires. That said, as a public defender, if I did have his case, I really would be very interested in understanding his medical history, his psychiatric status, um, just really, it, it would be almost more inquisitive of trying to figure out how could you do something like this, right? Like what happened earlier in your life? What chemical potentially imbalance is there with you? What diagnosis is there? I, I would just be digging so deep. And to be frank with you, Anna, hoping that something would be found because to the extent that it's not, then as you mentioned earlier, and as the judge noted, then we're just dealing with like pure, pure, unexcused evil. Does that make sense? I mean, that's oh, really kind of how I was approaching this when I was thinking about if I would have ever been in a position where I had to represent him, I would have needed something to get a hook on because if I don't have it, then what it really means is that on earth, there really is just legit pure evil. And, you know, that's kind of tough to accept. But this case I, makes you think about it. I believe that there is pure evil. I really do. You know, everyone, not everyone, but a lot of people claim, oh, insanity, which is what the defense tried in this case. They tried to say that Jeremy, this was a fit of insanity. Um, and here's the problem. <laughs> the court had trouble finding any doctor who could possibly support the claim that he was insane. So the judge just tossed that out because there was nothing to support that he was insane. I do believe that there is pure evil. You know, I, I, I really do. Because there, I, I also think that when you are this evil, clearly within you, wherever that resides, whether it's in your head or your heart, your soul, obviously you don't have one in this case, um, something is disconnected. Right. Something yeah. in the human being is disconnected. And, um, you know, it's way beyond a sensitivity chip. There's plain right and wrong. And for this person, it just didn't matter. It just didn't matter. Absolutely not. So they did try that. And I, I hear you. I think, I think we are always curious about how someone could do something so horrible. Yeah. And maybe there's just no understanding it because there's never going to be an answer that's good enough. And there's never going to be an explanation that will ever make us go, oh. Because there is no oh moment when you- Not in this. Thing. No. Not in this case, because no one did that to him, clearly, right? So it's like, even if he does have a history of trauma, you know, as a child himself, it clearly never got to that level with him. And I think that, you know, when you're dealing with these instances, and you and I have talked about this before, like in cases dealing with like road rage and stuff. And we always talk about how you want to take a step back from that anger and that emotion and not act in that moment. And I think here, you know, when people go into those blind rages, you know, from a cliche standpoint, what, what do you see sometimes? People maybe throw like a glass of cold water just to like wake someone up, right? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And I, I think in this instance, if when that little girl, or I don't, I don't know if it was a little girl, a little boy that was, you know, being stabbed, screaming until they were no longer screaming anymore. If those screams weren't the, you know, so to speak, glass of cold water for him to come out of that rage and he wasn't able to, then you kind of have me a little bit, Anna, in terms of proving your case out for pure evil, short of, you know, there being some other diagnosis that maybe we're not privy to just because I wasn't in the courtroom as the defense was, you know, representing him. So I don't know, but it's uh, re probably the saddest story I've had to you know ever read in preparing just both to come on and have this discussion with you. But just in general, I've dealt with a lot of criminal cases and like that judge. I've never really seen or heard of anything this that just hit this hard, especially for me, someone that does this work, right? No, oh, absolutely. The trial lasted 10 days. Jurors in Essex County deliberated for less than two hours. I can't believe it even took that long. I think because there were 29 counts. So I guess if you give each count, what, maybe 
10 minutes or, you know, I, I became a lawyer. I'm not good at math, but you know what I'm saying? Like they maybe just had to quickly go down each count, but because there were so many, it sounds like that's the only thing that led to the two hours. You know, if it was five counts, they may have been out of there in three minutes. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, and they must be so traumatized after this. They have to be. Everyone involved oh. in this case is traumatized. Now, obviously never to the degree of the survivors. So, um, and you know, Anna, like the jurors would have had to see the autopsy photos oh. and like they would have had to see the crime sample. Like you and I are just kind of think seeing it in our head, you mm -hmm. know, being a juror or a you know court officer or a judge, even a defense attorney in those kinds of situations where you have to look at those kinds of photos. Oh, you talk about PTSD. It's like you walk out of the courtroom with a medical diagnosis because it's really tough going through those kinds of trials and like the judge nobody's ever really even seen one of those mm -hmm. so it's yeah. it's tough it, it really is i have to admit and you know in all my years i've seen some really horrible things things i wish that i could unsee yeah. and you can't really ever unsee it i mean many of those things still haunt me and then as i became more mature as yeah. a reporter as a journalist um most of the times i I will not, I will specifically say, I will look at certain crime scene photos, but when it comes to horribly mutilated, and I, I just, yeah. I can't because I can never fill up, I can never erase it from my brain. I can't, I can't, no matter where I put it, it goes away, but then it comes back up. So I, I really feel for them and the work that they did, you know, they, they really, trying to keep their community safe and get justice for their fellow members of the community. Sentencing. It's a, you know, yeah, I'm yeah, sorry. Yeah. No, no, no. Go ahead. You, you said it all. Go ahead. Uh, sentencing was extremely emotional, obviously, because the survivors and the family members of the victims had a chance to say what they needed to say without being edited. And you can see the emotion. You can hear the fury, the pain. You know, Philip, Despite how emotional they were and the things they had to say, I, I still think, I, I can't believe they had the strength, but, you know, and let me say that again. I, I'm trying to, clearly, I mean, this was an incredibly emotional moment for these families, and even though they were struggling, they still held it together. I don't know how they continue to hold it together. I think the judge said the most interesting thing. He said at the end of this, he said, I don't know how you recover from all of this. I don't know how you live with this. It, oh man. It, it, it's clearly a part, when, when things like this happen, right? Like first you start to dig to like, how could it happen, right? So we already had that discussion in regards to, you know, how could he do this? What, what's going on with him? But then you start to go over to like the why, right? And it's like the sacrifice of, of, of these children and, and the pain and torment with which they had to live out the, you know, last few minutes of their lives. Why, right? And with respect to the family and in terms of that recovery, you know, I think there's clearly something that's meant for them later on down the line with which this was a test that they had to get through to build up whatever amount of strength and courage and um, you name it, that they're going to need for some later test later on down the line. And I know that may sound all, you know, kooky and, and spiritual and what have you, but like really when you start dealing with these kinds of just unimaginable crimes and just this unimaginable behavior that one human being could exhibit toward another, that's the only way sometimes that I can chalk it up because like, why should this family have to go through this? as opposed to, you know, everyone else in many respects or a lot of others who will never have to, right? And who will never even have to imagine it. And, you know, they have to live it and live it every day and try to, you know, recover past this. Just again, God bless them. And, you know, this, I think, will be a testament to their strength with whatever um, ultimately life is going to put before them moving forward. So on March 4th, Jeremy Arrington was convicted of 28 counts, including three counts of murder, three counts of attempted murder, burglary, criminal restraint, unlawful possession of a handgun. It goes on and on and on. In addition to three consecutive life sentences for murder, the judge imposed 50-year sentences for each of the three attempted murder convictions for the surviving victims. Like, 
under no circumstances is this guy getting off on anything. I mean, the judge right. just threw the book at him as he should have. And because of the No Early Release Act, I believe in New Jersey, um, he will have to serve a total of 281 years of his 375-year sentence before he's eligible for parole. This guy's going nowhere. Uh, I, the judge said you committed perhaps the most horrific, heinous, cruel, and depraved murders this county has ever seen. He said, this case is the worst that I have ever seen. And he actually, this man, this convicted killer, actually, I don't know, apologized. He made a statement in court. Okay, because I'm just like not even going to concede that that was an apology. Mm-hmm. He used words like this was uncalled for. Give me a break. And that he would switch places with the victims if he could. Now that's a lie. That's a lie. I mean, the, the crazy thing is, so at the tip of the iceberg, I guess it was uncalled for. So it's not actually a statement that has no truth. It was certainly uncalled for, but that is at the very tip. You know, as we start to go, you know, more towards the base in regards to like what this really was, it, it's when we start to kind of reach that level of, you know, as you discussed earlier, evil, right? It, it, it's beyond uncalled for, you know, and I, and I think in regards to just any kind of acknowledgement that this was wrong, you know, I guess maybe the court took that for what it was worth, maybe, you know, 50 years as opposed to 60 or 70, I, I don't know, for the attempted murders, but at the end of the day, He's not getting out. And, you know, I'm not pro death penalty in any respect, but I'll tell you this. He better be lucky this happened in Jersey as opposed to, say, Texas. Right. Mm -hmm. Um, Because this is certainly a capital eligible offense there. And, you know, I I think probably the jury verdict would have come within the same rapid fire uh, (laughs) manner with which it did here in Jersey there. And I think it would have been a much more severe penalty. So, you know, at the end of the day, yeah, he, he never needs to see the light of day again. Um, but it, like whatever sentence it was, whether it's death penalty, whether it's the 280 some odd years he got, um, it's not going to bring anybody back and it's not going to take this experience away from anyone. And, you know, that's that's the saddest part that the system can never rectify. That justice is never complete. Yeah. It is time for our comments section. These are the crime stories that you all are talking about on social media. Here's our producer, Will Updike, with the latest on what's going on. Hey, Will. Hey, Anna. Hey, Philip. How's it going? Hey, Will. How you doing? Doing good. All right. So this one involves a feline as a weapon. A Florida woman reportedly used a pet cat to batter her girlfriend. Uh, cat as a weapon. That's a new one for me. So apparently what happened here is the perpetrator got into an argument with her girlfriend in their apartment. Now, according to a report, the suspect then took the cat, held it up to her girlfriend's face and reportedly swore on the animal's life that she was not cheating. Now, naturally, the animal was very freaked out by this. It ended up scratching the girlfriend's face. The victim had multiple lacerations all over her face. So the police ended up going to the home, arresting the suspect for domestic battery. And upon being taken into custody, according to a report, uh, the suspect here said that she was the true victim. uh, And the affidavit said at the same time, the defendant uh, was very polite and compliant. Uh, So not that she's a a victim in this one, uh, but uh, apparently she was polite with police. So she was later released um, and. Jail records actually show, though, that this was not her first arrest for domestic battery. Unclear if any of those other ones involved another pet, however. So uh, people had a lot to say about this one. Uh, Molly C said brings a cat fight to a whole new level. Makes yes. sense. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. That'll do it. Um, there's going to be a lot of puns coming up. So uh, I apologize <laughs> if that's not your your cup of tea. Um, Dizzy Ann said, I have officially heard everything. Cat scratch fever. Um, <laughs> Billy P said, uh, the attack left the victim cat a tonic. Mm-hmm. Yes. <laughs> that might be, that might, that might be my favorite. Actually. Okay. Yeah. I like cat uh, fights so far. <laughs> BR says almost the perfect crime. 
Ooh, that's good too. Creative. Mm-hmm. Uh, Warren P says, so then would it be okay to assume that this is a feline or more of a histamineer? Oh, a histamineer. I think we have okay. a winner. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> oh my God. I can't believe that she wasn't charged with animal cruelty. Yeah. Yeah. Unclear uh, if that will, will come up at a later date, but uh, yeah, not, um, not a good use of a, of a pet. Just leave no. the cat out of it. Leave the cat, <laughs> leave out, the cat you know, out of cat, it. Cats don't care. And, and they, they, you know, they can barely care about you, let alone fighting <laughs> your fights. Just, just put them down and let them love, but not this. It's ridiculous. This. Poor kitty it's cat. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's going to do it for this week's comments. Thank you so much. Bye, Will. See you next week. See ya. Take care, Will. Well, that is our episode for this week. Thank goodness we can end on a slightly lighter note. This was a heavy one. Philip, uh, where can people find you, either social media or if they need an attorney in New York? And I can always be found at ESQ Hamilton. That's across social media. And of course, uh, the firm Hamilton Clark LLP. Just go to Hamilton Clark. Clark has an E at the end of it, LLP.com. Thank you so much for coming back. We love having you, Philip. It's always a pleasure. I love your insight and also your partner, Lance. I I love that we practically have the whole firm represented on the program. (laughs) (laughs) I'll definitely tell Lance, I I, I saw you once he gets back to the office, um, he'll he'll, he'll be happy we did the show today. So always good to see you, Anna. We, we, we love having you. And, you know, I tell people this, I, I found you all on Instagram <laughs> and I just, I'm always looking for like different voices to talk about crime. And I'm like, they're fabulous. I found them on Instagram. You never know who you're going to find on Instagram, right? You never know. And I'm mm-hmm. glad you found us. So, yeah. you know, anytime, you know, we'll be here. Great. You can always find me on Instagram and other social media sites under Anna G News, Anna with one N. Um, We want to make sure that you know you can find not only this podcast, but all our podcasts, wherever you get your podcasts, subscribe to our YouTube channel. We've got nearly 5 million subscribers. Are you one of them? I hope that you are. And sign up to receive our newsletter at truecrimedaily.com. Until next week, I'm your host, Anna Garcia. This is True Crime Daily, the podcast. And as we always say, don't do crime. <laughs>